we've teed up throughout the day uh, quite a bit on the high level issues of agency structure um, and touched on lots of the issues I think this panel is, is, is purposed for uh, up to and including what's happening in part three litigation, um, the sort of big $64,000 uh, question in front of the Supreme Court now at least puts some of the, the future of administrative litigation at the FTC into play uh, and, and acts on. Uh, but you've got a whole host of issues, I think, that both uh, are standalone issues in terms of part three litigation and its sort of cost and benefits on its, on its own, as well as how they fit into the broader uh, structural issues we've been discussing in terms of agency independence um, and some of the constitutional issues raised uh, in the earlier panels. Um, administrative litigation has been, at the FTC, has been a great topic of interest of, of, of mine since my, uh, my old days at the FTC uh, when I learned and then later published that the FTC's win rate um, and for those of you who are admin law people who follow the SEC cases or the administrative law judge cases from other agencies, this will sound a little bit different, but with the FTC win rate in front of its own agency is, a, is 100%. Um, the agency issue faced in some of the others is the ALJ sort of rubber stamps the, the commission, not, not so much at the FTC. And FTC's win rate in front of now just Judge Chapel used to be eight administrative law judges not too long ago is uh, above 50, but not much. But when the cases get up to the commission um, where the ALJ has ruled uh, for FTC staff, uh, the commission affirms where the ALJ has ruled against, the commission reverses. And so you get a situation where, um, you know, it's, uh, it's nice to be the FTC staff in front of, uh, you know, home, home cooking's always good. Um, but, but does raise some issues, important issues, uh, where people have paid attention to uh, what's going on with part three process. And you've got a conflation of issues now. You've got Axon about the ability to get Article Three review, sort of independency of um, part three litigation. You've also got two agency losses in specific cases in front of Judge Chapel um, in part three litigation in both Illumina Grail and uh, Jewel Altria, so very, very different cases, and uh, we'll talk some about those as well and how they relate to the larger issues of what's happening on the FTC's litigation agenda. And then finally, um, the FTC does what its sister agency does, and it goes straight into Article Three court sometimes and tries to win cases the good old-fashioned way, um, and it's got lots of those ar around too. So, plenty to discuss in a, a sort of big, broad landscape, and we've got a wonderful panel we've brought together sort of immediately uh, to my right is my good friend Howard Shalansky, uh, who's professor at Georgetown, partner at Davis Polk, the administrator of OIRA, BE chief economist, all the things, uh, BE chief economist, FCC chief economist, uh, and uh, if you wanted to have somebody here to discuss both competition and administrative law, uh, you, you just uh, couldn't do better. Uh, Ashley Baker, Director of Public Policy at the Committee for Justice, uh, on her docket always both antitrust and Supreme Court cases, uh, and we are grateful to have uh, her with us. And uh, Gus Hurwitz down on my uh, far right, who I think has been thinking about the administration of antitrust and administrative law for, for a very long time, um, some of his earliest, earliest scholarly work, and now uh, professor at University of Nebraska School of Law. Um, let's get started, guys. Uh, Gus, there's a lot on the landscape uh, from part three to federal court to constitutional issues. Um, would it be unfair to ask you to make sense of all of it for us as an opening question? Let, let's, uh, <laughs> let's do it because I'm going to cheat and uh, just say you all can uh, go home, you can just watch the recording of Bill's uh, lunchtime talk because <laughs> that's what, how I'm gonna frame my, uh, uh, my thinking uh, and my uh, comments to kick things off um, because everything that uh, uh, we heard uh, over lunch is exactly right and I think that's the right way to think about 
a, a lot of the uh, litigation challenges. So uh, over lunch, we heard about the agency's relationship to uh, the executive and Congress. Uh, well, in the litigation setting, we're really uh, thinking about the agency's relationship to Article Three and the courts. Um, and we, we have all these terms that we use. Are we originalists or textualists or uh, 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 realists? Or how do we interpret the law? Are we formalists? Um, I think the overwhelming answer is we're pragmatists. When we're talking about the administrative state, the relationship between um, agency I, I, agency adjudication versus Article Three uh, litigation. Um, the reality is the agencies and the courts both know that neither of them is uh, the most institutionally competent in any given case, and it's a balancing act uh, to have the courts delegate agencies to act reasonably, bring reasonable cases, enforce those cases reasonably, uh, and uh, use congressional authority reasonably. And so long as the agencies are doing that, the courts are gonna say, good job. What you're doing is reasonable. You are helping keep government functioning. This couldn't work if we, the courts, had to micromanage um, everything that you do, if we had to review everything that you do. So if you're acting reasonably, if you're not abusing the power that Congress uh, uh, gave you, rubber stamp. Um, and over the course of uh, the 20th century, that is how the administrative state evolved and uh, developed. Uh, this was particularly true in the early years of the administrative state, uh, 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 the APA um, mid-century, the ascendance of the legal process school of thought uh, in legal academia. Um, we want to put the uh, decision-making authority in whatever entity is most best able to exercise that authority, um, and that's how the system works. Now, what's happened um, over the last couple of decades, we've seen this at the FTC, we've seen this at the SEC, we've seen this in many agencies, is agencies have started to realize, oh, wait, we've got all of this power that we could use not power that we need to use reasonably, we've got all this power that Congress has given us and the courts have given us this Chevron deference and the APA, we need to go through the entire administrative process before things can get to Article Three courts. We've got all this power, let's use it. Um, so we've seen uh, with the FTC uh, extensive use of settlements and consent decrees uh, to develop bodies of law. That's what uh, uh, Mike was asking about uh, I, uh, at some level uh, in his questions um, earlier. Um, we have the incredible win, win rate, uh, self-win rate uh, at the FTC. What's going on there? Well, we know what's going on there. Um, and because of the uh, finality requirements, because you need to exhaust all administrative remedies before you can get to Article Three courts, um, it makes it really difficult for litigants to, uh, to overcome this great deal of power times deference that uh, the agencies have. So what happens when agencies start to abuse all of that great power they've been given? It's a balancing act. If they're not acting reasonably, the courts are going to start to say, well, we're going to need to tighten uh, our control over you, tighten in the reins. And that's what we're seeing with uh, the major questions doctrine, with uh, concerns about dialing in Chevron, and now with Axon. Um, and uh, uh, Jennifer mentioned earlier, uh, we also have uh, the SEC uh, uh, case, um, Cochrane, that uh, have been, they've been paired together uh, in the Supreme Court. Both of these cases go to this question of uh, can Congress by statute uh, uh, require uh, agency uh, parties to go through the entire administrative process before they can get to court to challenge the constitutionality of uh, a uh, agency action. Um, and the, the answer is going to be, I'm very confident in Axon, no. If a uh, agency is trying to exercise unconstitutional authority or possibly this is how broad will Axon be? Uh, uh, is a agency trying to uh, unconstitutionally exercise its authority? 
you don't need to uh, uh, go through this entire process before you can get to an Article III judge uh, that is, who is able to exercise as a check on the unreasonableness of the agency's conduct. It's all about maintaining this balance. The current system uh, is out of balance, and what we're seeing is uh, uh, we're, we're taking the agencies into the shop to get their tires realigned and rebalanced, um, and uh, the mechanics of the Supreme Court are going to be doing that. Um, I could say more stuff, but uh, that's boring, so back to you, Josh. Let me ask something before I move to Ashley. I'm used to, in the, uh, I guess, keeping with the, the car metaphor, in the antitrust world, the rebalancing, you know, the mechanic takes a really long time. Um, we get slow, gradual, sort of case-by-case -case, uh, changes. And this idea, I think uh, Bill Kovacic said dur during his keynote, you get, you get the deference you earn. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a reading of these cases that makes me, the recent losses, both in front of the ALJ and Jewel Altria, um, the question teed up in Axon and Illumina Grail, and I think six losses in federal court, pr pretty fast. Um, and it's been a while since we've talked about a, w a win uh, for either agency. Um, there's an interpretation of those losses that is uh, the world is responding to the agency earning less deference, not in the, the, the formal administrative law sense of the word. But man, that seems like a fast adjustment to me. And so I'm, I'm left at a little bit of a little, little miffed at how quickly that adjustment has happened. Do you read? The ALJ losses the sort of challenges they're facing as a, as a response to something the agency is doing or to secular sort of outside of our little antitrust yeah. world changes? I interesting question. I, I thought you were going to go uh, in a different direction. Um, I, I think my answer is no. I'd like I, you to ask the question you thought of too. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, I might have already forgotten it. Um, but my, my answer to uh, uh, the question is actually I think no. I don't think that uh, current that the uh, uh, ALJ cases uh, certainly not, and I, I don't think that the uh, uh, judicial losses are responding yet to this. Um, I think that uh, the the real judicial slapdowns will come from uh, the Supreme Court uh, primarily, uh, and uh, maybe some circuit court losses on appeal, but I, I think what we're seeing is overly aggressive enforcement actions where you're going to lose because you're bringing bad cases, not because there is uh, some recalibration um, going on. Uh, and I, I think if we look back to the Supreme Court um, in the early uh, 2000s in cases like uh, uh, Trinco and Credit Suisse, um, where the court was talking about uh, the relationship between antitrust and regulation, um, the, the court kind of expressed two competing uh, uh, ideas, um, which I've argued summed together to be uh, this idea of why call administrative antitrust, that the, the Supreme Court actually would prefer um, the agencies uh, to be developing antitrust norms because there's some lack of comfort with the idea that antitrust is this one exceptional area of the law where we have ju uh, judicial federal common law developing these norms. Um, so some preference for agencies like the FTC to be developing uh, uh, new antitrust norms combined with, however, the idea that they wanted more st uh, stability in the antitrust law is particularly important compared relevant to, uh, related to uh, all areas of law. Antitrust law, we need stability. Um, and uh, we should have slow incremental development. And that's part of the reason that the Supreme Court uh, had a preference or expressed some preference for regulatory approaches to um, antitrust law instead of having punctuated every five, 10 years, you have a really major court uh, case that gets up to the Supreme Court where something big might happen. We should have more continual, slow development of uh, antitrust law as economic knowledge, uh, the frontier of economic knowledge continues to move. Um, but that's not what the FTC is trying to do. They're not trying to do a slow frontier incremental uh, uh, movement in antitrust law. They're trying to uh, uh, show up and redefine what antitrust law is. And I think uh, the, the court's response to that is gonna be, oh, hell no. 
We said, we trust you to do this slowly and incrementally, modestly. Um, the, the economy depends on stability in this area, and you are just disrupting everything. So I think the uh, Supreme Court uh, has, in previous cases, kind of spoken to uh, the approach I think we're likely to see here. Ashley, similar question uh, to you, sort of with Axon coming, um, administrative apparatus sort of a, a held up for question at the same time you've got the agency sort of running into federal court uh, and, and struggling. It seemed like a pretty important time to have the, the option to do in-house litigation when you're, you're getting beat up in, in Article Three courts and uh, the fight coming to a, a, a head. How do you see those trends running into each other? Well, I mean, for the purposes of the court, I think what's really kind of at the forefront of this is the fact that ultimately the court's deciding, you know, a issue that's related to judicial review, and that's a lot different than something more specific to, you know, what the agency should or should not do, um, even you know, what the statute says. I mean, for, you know, the purposes of Exxon is whether or not a constitutional, a collateral constitutional claim um, should be heard within um, the FTC or not. I, th I think the court will rule pretty clearly on that. And then, you know, you have these mounting losses outside of the FTC, you have these other challenges, You've, it's become more acceptable just to you know, go straight to federal court and challenge the agency's structure or um, statutory authority, and that's becoming somewhat of a trend, and I can get that to that in a second. Um, but that's because there's going to be you know, more of a win rate there. That's um, a better option, it seems, for some of these companies um, when the alternative is to go in-house first and exhaust that process. And by the end of that process, by the way, there's often not really a company left. Um, if you look at um, LabMD, for example, that is one example of a company um, that was kind of killed by this internal process. Someone used the analogy to me the other day, and I can't remember who um, said it, but it's much like the um, when the Labor um, Secretary Donovan was um, acquitted of um, criminal fraud charges, he said, well, which agency do I go back to get my reputation? <laughs> um, and that's much like what these companies are you know, um, put in that position of. It's the process itself that's the punishment. And more broadly, we see these issues of judicial review, and it looks more and more to the courts, I think, like the the in-house process is meant to circumvent judicial review um, under Article III courts. So you have not only um, the facts and acts on itself, but you have um, outside of the court, you have the Lumina Grell merger challenge, you have the um, Jewel Altry merger challenge. Those are two instances in which the ALJ ruled against the agency um, until very recently. The, it, um, the FTC had gone, I think, 25 years before that had happened. Um, so that's, you know, as Josh was saying, the win rate is astronomical. Um, so the way the court is, is um, approaching this is a bit different. And I think the FTC really has, has underestimated where the court is on these administrative law issues more broadly. Uh, I mean, the last time the agency really went full speed ahead in the 1970s with rulemaking, I mean, we had the Burger Court, which was you know, more constitutional conservative or whatever you know, label you want to use than the Warren Court, but they were still very reluctant to um, really go against or revisit certain past precedent when it, they had considered that settled law for a long time. Um, and this court, less so, and there are a lot of lawsuits for it to work with. Howard, let me um, give an equally broad and uh, not so, uh, well, two things for you. One, react to anything you've heard. Uh, one thing I've, I've not asked yet, but I think would be useful to put in the discussion is um, why part three litigation anyway? The, the, the story is, I mean, what's, what's the value of it? The story is FTC is gonna do norms creation uh, we're going to be ahead of the curve and create some norms. And uh, FTC's had that power around for a, a really long time. And I think if you can think of more than one or two cases where the FTC has used Part 3 authority to do norms creation and competition law, then you can think of one or two more than I can. And you can argue about the hospital cases, right? That's the example everyone gives. The FTC was getting... This is a technical term for the audience, but getting their behind handed to them in the hospital cases, they do a study, they fix it, they go to part three, they win hospital cases. You ask defenders of part three uh, litigation, come up with a second example, and the room goes, goes mostly quiet. Um, the question I think is, is all this fight about part three litigation, 
worth it? We've got the two cases pending now. The agency's not really using it all that much. Uh, maybe they use it in cases where they don't think they can win in federal court anyway. Uh, is all of this worth a candle and respond? Well, I, I mean, looking at Illumina Grell, which I just mentioned, I mean, it is notable that they filed the case first in federal district court, withdrew there, and then went back and filed it in house. Um, and I think, you know, with that case in the background, it's certainly easy to um, claim some gamesmanship there. And then you know, the FTC's own ALJ ruled that no, that this is not a threat to competition. So um, that didn't work out as they had planned either. Howard, what do you think? Uh, look, I, I think that the Part three structure, you know, obviously it, it's an old statute and there were some very clear motivations for putting the part three option in place uh, in 1914 and subsequently preserving it uh, just because there was a sense that antitrust enforcement um, by the Justice Department of the Sherman Act had been lax, uh, you know, in the, in the early days. So I think creating a more administrative structure, particularly as pertains to mergers, sort of was an understandable thing for Congress to do when they did it. In terms of what the use of part three has been, again, I think you know, there's a very theoretical argument one can make that it's for norms creation. It's for figuring out what that set of behaviors are that will violate section five that fall outside of the Sherman Act. So this sort of, you know, um, ill-defined set of cases that are beyond the Sherman Act and within Section 5. But I think as Josh says, that's not really a place that the, uh, uh, where, where, where Part 3 courts have played a big role. But, but let me just throw this out there as a possibility. The knowledge of parties coming before the agencies that there is this Part 3 administrative option when the agencies are pursuing somewhat novel claims. And again, the list is fairly short. But if we think about invitations to collude, as an example, um, the norm against invitations to collude and the warning shot that parties doing this would be called into the FTC and investigated and possibly put through an expensive um, compliance process and then have to you know, sign a con some kind of injunctive consent decree was backed up by the knowledge that you know, the agency could, if you refuse to play ball, go to part three. So it's possible that part three plays an important role as sort of a last resort that has enabled the agency to do some of the things it's done by settlement. I'll give you another example beyond uh, the invitation to collude cases, which you, know, you can't get to under section one because you, know, you need a completed conspiracy. Um, so that's an area of a maybe true section five conduct. When the FTC was investigating Intel uh, you know, between 20 and 10 years ago, the kinds of loyal dis loyalty discounting issues were not well settled in terms of where they fell under Section 2 of the Sherman Act. And so it was good for the FTC to have the Section 5 authority to go in and look at these share-based loyalty discounts and to sort of push, uh, push Intel uh, to come to some kind of settlement, creating norms that share-based loyalty discounts were going to attract attention. Again, that didn't go to court, but it could have gone to Part 3. A complaint was drafted. So um, I think that the part three courts may play a role beyond, or the part three process may play a role beyond what is evident from the results of actual ALJ hearings. So that's just one thing that I, that I will throw out there uh, as a possibility. But I do think that the FTC has been very mindful of legitimacy questions uh, it, through a lot of its existence. Uh, there are times the agency has overreached but it has largely tried to stay, and you know, I like Gus's formulation of this sort of you know, incremental push the doctrine forward um, by you know, putting out policy papers, pursuing initiatives that were very much in keeping with the evolving doctrine, evolving uh, economic thinking, um, and then occasionally you know, go making some pretty aggressive moves in court, but, but actually being quite successful. You know, until this last run of sort of bad luck, I think there were something like 29 out of 32. I can think of three losses, mm -hmm. Steris, LabCorp, Lundbeck, I have to think back during the Obama administration, but, but not very many. So there was a lot of success in the courts because, things, because the agency was, even if sometimes pushing the boundaries, was staying within the boundaries. Now, I just wanna say something about what I think is happening now. I, I don't view this as crazy, reckless overreach, necessarily. 
I think if you were to talk to people making the decisions about bringing the hard cases that the agencies are bringing, and we have a limited sample from the FTC, but if I use the DOJ as an instrumental variable and their, their recent losses in court, I think what they would tell you is we're trying to actually push things back to something we've already evolved from. So we're not trying to push things forward too aggressively, we're trying to go back to a somewhat, we think, more sensible, more proven way of doing antitrust enforcement. And they will anchor those, those arguments in the most recent Supreme Court decisions that they see as being relevant. The problem is there has been a lot of common law through the circuit courts and the district courts and the intervening you know, 30, 40 years, whatever time you wanna pick. And you can't simply back up over that. Mm -hmm. And so what is happening is they're running into judges who are saying, okay, but wait, we've got all this circuit law, we've got all this district law, we've got all of this precedent. You can't just back up over those, over those spikes. And so the agency is in a tricky spot. They feel like, the agencies are in a tricky spot. They feel like they want to go to a different mode of analysis. They have a limited time within which to do it, given you know, the way administrations can change. And they're dealing with a common law process that is extremely, extremely slow. Um, if Frank Easterbrook got one thing dead right in his 1985 Limits of Antitrust article, it's that doctrine locks things in and evolves slowly. Now his view was that markets would self-correct really quickly so we should not make doctrinal errors. In the view of the current agencies, and there are areas in which I personally believe them to be, to be correct, um, areas where I don't think they're correct, the doctrine has locked in some pretty uh, heavy burdens on plaintiffs and an anti-enforcement tilt that they want to correct, but what tools do they have? Either administrative tools at the FTC, let's resort to rulemaking, let's resort to novel cases in part three, or taking their chances with, you know, on a flyer with a very aggressive argument in the federal courts that, that they're going to, to reject. And I think there's a very hard place for the agency to be because I think there just isn't a clear mechanism for the agency to shortcut the doctrinal evolution project process. And I think that's what they're running into with these losses. And I think if they try to do it by rulemaking, I, I don't have the benefit of having heard Bill's speech during lunch, um, so I risk saying something that sounds completely foolish and certainly not as good as what Bill would have said. But, but I think that the agency is walking on extremely, extremely shaky ground when they think that they have rulemaking authority for unfair methods of competition rules as a way of achieving through regulation the doctrinal shift that would take years to occur in court. I agree, and I, I would, for the most part, agree. And I, I would add that there's a big difference between what the FTC and the DOJ are doing right now, though, and that um, the FTC, particularly their focus over the past year, really has been less on bringing cases and more on, I mean, like you said, the FTC has over the years had to rein itself in every two decades or so. Um, they do something that pushes the boundary, and Congress um, kind of gives them a slap on the wrist, and they develop some internal processes and procedures that set some boundaries. And um, for the first year, of the Biden administration, the FTC seemed really focused just on taking down those guardrails, um, such as the 2015 um, Section 5 policy and other um, policies and procedures that they had kind of developed for the, you know, the safekeeping of the entire agency itself. So one thing that comes to mind, I'm going to say something that makes me very, very uncomfortable uh, from uh, uh, Howard's comments in particular. Um, one of the challenges that the agencies face right now is we're dealing with different types of firms and different economic theories that are competing in new, novel, hard to understand ways, uh, multi-sided markets, the Yamex case, I expect that's one of the ones you were, you're referring to with uh, uh, the, the burdens. Um, uh, lots of conglomerate activity and uh, add in the international competition to regulate and uh, uh, structure these markets. And the thing that I'm going to say that makes me uncomfortable uh, is I don't know that antitrust is the right lens to look at this sort of behavior um, and even this sort of competitive behavior. I think antitrust law is 
really good. We've got uh, really well-developed uh, understandings of certain types of behavior and how to deal with uh, clear vertical, clear horizontal uh, uh, conduct. And when we're getting into this more complicated stuff, I worry about uh, throwing the baby out with the bathwater sort of concerns when the, the agencies start trying to regulate enforce, regulate, I'm not sure what the right word is, uh, competition in these new markets uh, uh, that the antitrust agencies, that antitrust law is the right way to do it. And the, the reason that that makes me really uncomfortable is because that uh, kind of, op it doesn't kind of, that opens the door to the question, well, if we're not doing it through antitrust, uh, so, so Horowitz, you're telling us we should be just regulating these industries? And I, I'm not comfortable with that <laughs> um, either, but uh, I, I don't know that uh, antitrust uh, that we will be able to get to where we want or need to be in these new markets through a common law or part three or mm -hmm. norms development sort of approach. So let me, I'll, I'll answer, it's, it's, it's a really important point you just made, Gus, and I wanna respond in a couple of ways. So, so the first thing I would say is, I'm not ready to give up on antitrust as being effective for new kinds of industries, new kinds of technologies and um, you know, the economic activity that may be hard to detect or fully understand for a while. I, I do think that uh, there has to be a willingness to take some risks with antitrust that have not been the direction that the doctrine has gone, um, I would say, since, you know, the early 70s. And so we would have to reverse a little bit of our error cost uh, analysis and not worry so much about over-enforcement. Decide that as a policy matter, we don't know everything that these new technologies might do. We don't know everything about this new economic behavior. But we do know that it should make us more concerned about under-enforcement if we believe that these are going to lead to durable effects on the economy, whether it's durable monopoly, durable path dependency in technologies. And I think that part of what we're seeing the agencies do is actually take that view we are going to shift our presumption in favor of avoiding errors of under enforcement. So we see uh, cases of you know, allegedly nascent com competitors being acquired and challenges to those deals. Mm -hmm. uh, we see concerns about kinds of effects we don't fully understand, this amorphous basket of things called conglomerate effects which might have something to do with bundling or might have something to do with things that are hard to ferret out, but we're gonna worry about them and maybe block some of these deals even without a completely crisp articulation of exactly what harms will happen because we are making a prediction that there will be a substantial lessening of competition based on certain evidence that we might see, maybe it's intent evidence, maybe it's documentary evidence, and we're willing to make that, that prediction and live with our errors if we've made them. So there's a policy choice embedded in all of this that just says we need to kind of tilt antitrust in that direction. And if one accepts those risks and those losses, then antitrust can work. And then we may learn over time that we've made mistakes and adjust it backwards and forward. The other response I'll make is as to regulation, you know, I, I am not a great fan of regulation when there are good options for competition to perform the regulatory function. But I view regulation and competition as, and, and antitrust enforcement as complements. And my concern about regulation is not so much theoretical government centralized uh, intervention as just the practical and pragmatic drawbacks and the, the historical track record of rather poor performance of a lot of regulation, I'm speaking about economic regulation. So I tend to like to avoid it where possible. But I think that certain kinds of new industries that are evolving um, are ones where we might see a good complementarity between this antitrust enforcement that's trying to figure out how to gear itself to these industries and certain kinds of regulation. Now this is where I'm a naive optimist and you'll tell me I'm crazy, which is I do believe there's certain kind of you know, zero price, light-handed interconnection, interoperability regulation that can be put in place. Um, I think we've seen that proven out in certain areas of uh, telecommunications regulation and other things. And I have faith that Congress, courts, and a responsible agency will avoid the slippery slope 
of overreaching and regulating everything. But I recognize that history may not be on my side with that. You can tell your employer is Georgetown, not George Mason, because you immediately lose tenure at Mason. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. the way, it's the way it goes. This is the only time you've ever been on my left. <laughs> I'm going to steal Andy's joke. To them, I'm on, I'm on your right. Okay. Uh, let me, um, I, I like this point about uh, recalibration of policy and sort of what it means. M maybe these cases are, I won't say harder, but you know, different because of the technologies and so forth. And so we get a, a recalibration and you know, you got to bring some cases and maybe you frame that in terms of the way I think about cost of errors. Maybe you frame it in, in a difficulty of ferreting out the effects because it, it's, hard, it's hard to know. I think a really interesting but also challenging point for that view is, is the following. Um, there is a case in federal court against the, the every tech company that you can think of, and some you can't, uh, joined by 907 states uh, and suing you, you know, everybody for everything. Um, red states, blue states, the federal government, the FTC's in some of those, the DOJ's in some of those. Um, against every tech firm. Clearly under the belief, I, th I think, that under current law, they think they can, they can win. Uh, now, now, those cases will be resolved sometime three Olympics down the road. Um, but here we are now, and I'm wondering what that, any of that means. So some of those are last administration, some of those are this administration. But I'm wondering what any of that means for, to sort of, pull this back to the FTC, but the FTC, t t um, if it took its norm creation sort of article, excuse me, part three process seriously about that recalibration, you would see any of those cases in part three. You don't. You have, um, Ashley made the point, you've got Illumina Grail that started in Fed court and is in part three, you know, on the rebound on accident, and then you've got... Um, you know, Jewel Altria, which, which was always there, but they're not these types of cases. Uh, they came in and they, much to my chagrin, tore up the 2015 policy statement. It was like my fourth child. Uh, they, they tore it up on day one and they promised rulemaking and section five actions um, for the reasons we're, we're, you're saying. This is not an attempt at rulemaking. I think everybody paying attention, the I mean, FTC came in, they said, we're gonna do a rulemaking um, and, and they haven't. We'll get one. It's late. It's late. Um, but you don't have that sort of action in part three. You don't have it in rulemaking. You got a lot of speeches. And you have a lot of cases in federal, in, in, in federal court. Um, as if they were the DOJ. I, I think that as if they were the DOJ part is significant. Um, and one really significant, um, I tend to focus on kind of the, the non-tech um, cases more so with administrative law implications, is the FTC's complaint against Walmart, in which they're essentially trying to kind of take the, like, shoehorn Section 5 into the telemarketing sales rule in order to say that Walmart, by facilitating three different types of payment processors, and because sometimes those transactions include fraud, um, hold them liable under the TSR, which is quite a stretch of a theory, and it certainly not um, doesn't align with what the, like, what Josh said, what the FTC has been talking about, what they've been giving speeches about, and what um, those cases are um, outside of the Federal Trade Commission. If you haven't read the Walmart's um, reply to their complaint, it's really a big shot across the bow in terms of saying, you know, the, the FTC couldn't bring this case in the first place. Um, the DOJ it has the power to do this. The FTC can't bring a case on behalf of the people of the United States, um, and that the independent litigation authority given to the FTC in the 1970s, that that was unconstitutional because the agency does not act as it did under Humphrey's executor. Um, a really big shot across the bow there that I think um, tees things up for further litigation and makes it more likely that some companies, instead of um, trying to go through the process um, internally, will just go straight to federal court um, with claims against the entire structure of the agency. You all are looking at me as though you want me to say something. Yes, if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually had had something they wanted to say, and I just uh, uh, blanked on what it uh, uh, was. Um, so I'm not going to say something until it comes back to me. All right, let me ask, let me ask the, 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 the group. Can I, can I respond to yeah. your point, though, about, you know, Look, I, think, I do think that the agency, 
let, let's be mindful that you know. Well, you, you say it's getting late, but you know they haven't they haven't been there all that long. And late in the, the sense on the back end, not the front end. Okay. Late on if they passed a rule tomorrow. Understood. The idea that they're in power when it gets through is tough. questionable, right? Understood. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess what I would say is this: first of all, I have more optimism on that front than you do. And the um, but the second point that I would make is. Um, uh, Rulemaking is hard, and especially if you're an agency that's doing a new kind of rulemaking that you haven't done, and you realize that you've got the glare like that light right on you, right? So I have a feeling that they're going to want to make sure the first rule they put out there is a really good rule, that it's carefully documented, narrowly tailored, will survive all kinds of APA re review. And here's why I think they want to be very careful about that. They know well that they are going to get a challenge to their authority if it's a competition rule, even if it is the most sympathetic, well-wrought rule against non-competes for unskilled labor or something like that, things that you know, deprive people of their livelihoods unjustly. You know, you're a sandwich maker, you get a 15-hour jo hour, hour job and you can't work at another sandwich store, ridiculous. right? They want to have a rule that's carefully documented, carefully analyzed, and very sympathetic so that when it gets struck down on authority grounds, they can say, this is absurd that we don't have the authority to do that. So I think they are being very, very careful and strategic. At least, I have no knowledge, I should be clear, like I have zero behind the scenes knowledge. I just speculate that there's some smart people at the FTC. We may disagree with many things they do, but they are smart people. I'm hoping that they are strategic in that way and that explains the delay. If that's not what's happening, then I think you're right. It's too late and they have a real problem. So I, uh... I thought, Howard, this is where you were going to go. I'm glad that you didn't because this is why I had wanted to say before. Uh, so what, one thing that I think we need to recognize uh, on the delay side is they uh, didn't have a three commissioner majority um, until relatively right. recently. Um, and uh, in the last couple of months, we've started to see stuff uh, uh, start to roll out. I expect, as Howard suggests, we are going to see uh, probably in the next month or so a UMC rule uh, uh, proposal on uh, non-competes. Um, the uh, agenda for the next uh, open com uh, uh, commission meeting was released today. It has three more ANPRs. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're definitely starting to push through a much more aggressive uh, rulemaking. Uh, uh, Going back to um, the uh, Howard's previous uh, points about um, the the commission acting as a normal entrepreneur and developing uh, uh, things in this area and more optimism there, I, I'm I'm not unsympathetic to that, but I think that the commission has a real problem and this administration has a real problem if they want to have uh, respect from the courts uh, as they go through that process which is they are fire spitting activists on these issues and they're not, uh, if you look at a lot of the issues that they're concerned about, they're not traditional competition style issues, especially when we're talking uh, on uh, the, the, the labor side of issues, they want to restructure, reprioritize us away from the consumer welfare to some broader public interest uh, uh, welfare concept that's nebulous, and I, I expect the courts are going to, if they were trying clearly to be uh, uh, good shepherds of the antitrust law and push into these new areas, um, they would be more likely to uh, uh, get a warmer reception. And Regarding APA challenges to rulemaking, you can tell that the agency is cognizant of the potential for APA challenges because, I mean, just look at the questions that are in the RFIs. They're a lot different than um, previous administrations. It's, you know, give us examples of why this is the correct policy um, and, you know, do we have the statutory authority to do what we are planning to do here? And it, that doesn't mean there would necessarily be a good rule coming out of it. Um, I mean, hopefully there would be. I, I have my own doubts, but um, it seems like they're certainly um, setting things up because they know that it will be challenged, and that doesn't mean that they're necessarily taking into regard all public input either. Howard, I, mean, I guess I would just respond. I, I, I do think that um, you know I want to respond to the fire spitting activist <laughs> comment. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> um, I, look, I, I think there's some truth to the fact that they are activists, whether what they're, they're spitting is fire or, you know, truth is, you know, in the eye of the beholder or, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, I, I, I do think, though, there's a big difference between 
the activism in the speeches, in uh, a lot of the uh, uh, policy priorities that are being announced, and what you actually see when you read the complaints. Um, mm -hmm. So first, a disclosure, I provided legal advice to Facebook, now Meta, during the course of their FTC investigation. Uh, so I probably know too much about what went on behind the scenes, but if you read the complaint, it, it is utterly conventional. The, the only thing that's odd about it is it may be a bit underwhelming. Um, you know, these are kind of substantial lessening of competition from two mergers dressed up as a series of conduct that, con that constitutes a Section 2 violation. I, I don't see a lot of fire, um, you know, and, and Jeb Boesberg will decide, Judge Boesberg will decide how much truth. Um, but again, you know, I think that, you know, to the credit of the agency, I, you know, will not talk about all of the things they consider. It was a serious investigation that they undertook under relatively conventional criteria. Um, I think if you look at even some of the complaints in the cases that the DOJ and the FTC mm -hmm. have lost, like let's take Illumina Grail. You know, look, the, 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 the vertical foreclosure theories that were at stake in Illumina Grail were, were, were not crazy. They were boundary pushing because of the amount of speculation, of the amount of forward-looking prediction that had to be uh, sort of premised on that. Ditto with the sort of information, um, uh, abusive information theory on the vertical aspects of the DOJ's United Health Care change. And again, I just know what anyone knows from the outside on those cases. But, but I don't see, I see sort of pushing a harder line, taking some risk, but I don't see sort of the kind of crazy activism that I would expect to get a court really riled up. But where I do see the activism potentially being a liability is just this. In the atmospherics of how any court is going to think about the FTC's or DOJ's level of judgment in bringing a case. And there's always a little bit, especially at the pleading stage, of you know, how much caution, care, judgment, how well thought out is this? When you overstep sort of the norms by a large amount of what established doctrine is, what established precedent is, or just what is within the scope of what the agency should be thinking about. You know, all right, you, want, you care about the labor, you care about the environment, you care about diversity, equity, and inclusion. What, how do you pull those into an antitrust analysis? And when they start to think that you are engaged in not just mission creep, but mission leap, you really do start to lose, you know, it gets to the, the, the deference you earn point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They will step back and say, we're not gonna give you deference, not just on these broader, crazier things, but even on the things that are more narrow because we question your judgment. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think a lot of the sort of rhetoric about every antitrust agency before us has failed. Uh, the doctrine is disaster. Every economist who ever flew in and out of the city of Chicago shall hereby be banned and canceled. I mean, all right, I'm obviously way overstating, but there, there's a flavor of that. And that tends to lead to a question about judgment, about what you're really after. And just when it comes to the FTC, it's, one has to be very careful. When you move beyond the confines of what the statute tells them to do, you start to develop this impression of a five-member commission making decisions about how to allocate welfare or what values to be pursued. And people start to get the feeling that, okay, now you're not just being aggressive on antitrust. You're treading into the prerogatives of things that should be decided by demo representative democratic institutions. And that's just not a bunch of, you know, people with particular views on the Constitution. That's sort of people watching an agency making decisions about their lives and about values that they actually want to make for themselves or have their representative electives make through the legislative process. And that's where I think the agency could run into real difficulty if that activism really hit hit the road in terms of some of the complaints they filed. This raises for me, I'm going to so steal creep versus leap, that's, that's happening. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but this raises for me a, a little bit of what I think is, a, is an interesting puzzle that I'm going to try to get you all to, to solve for me, which is if I were an agency wanting to move the law, um, I've got a couple of choices available to me run into Article Three courts, make circuit splits, sort of make law the old fashioned slow way, a la um, John Leibowitz's FTC in the reverse payment cases, right? Slow, get it done. Um, maybe didn't get all they wanted, but got, got some of it. 
one way is Article Three courts, and they're, they're, they're losing there. And I, I agree with your characterization of the complaints in entirety. There's, um, if they're, they're not losing because the complaints are wild and wooly, they're not proving the facts alleged in, right. in the complaints, mm -hmm. and you don't, you don't win that way. But Article Three is one route. Rulemaking is another, and, and we'll get some of that, but I, I, probably you're right. The first will be a you know, sort of tamer rule to try to establish some authority. But what I was told in FTC lore since I was a young child was the purpose of, that's all we talked about at the table. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we, we talked about the Telecom Act. That's right. Was, was this was what part three was for. Part three was for, um, you, you want to stretch your predictions in these tough cases. You want to work in some, you know, not straight economic welfare, but sort of fuzzier thing. You write the opinion. You've guaranteed yourself 100% of the time you will win. That's nice work if you can get it. You, you write the opinion yourself. You use all of the expertise of the agency, you muster all of the expertise you can and channel it through the opinion and send it to a court of appeals in an attempt to persuade them. Mm -hmm. I'm a little bit, I think the puzzle is, why not? the other two are really hard. Doing it in court is hard and they're losing. Doing it in rulemaking is really hard and they're gonna lose. That's my view. <laughs> uh, your mileage may, may vary. The other thing is right there. And I don't like the other thing, right? I got in trouble as a commissioner for saying, we're ruling for ourselves all the time. This is stupid. Please, Congress, take the authority away. So like my bias is sort of fully on the table. But if I were giving advice to them on how to win, it would make me sad if they did this. But why not use part three? I'll just add a fourth option to the table, um, which is, uh, learn lessons about the industry, either using a uh, whole other set of issues, as 6B studies, or sure. just do your own studies, uh, or take the cases that you're bringing and losing, um, and go to Congress and ask for statutory change uh, in your authority. So th just uh, going back to one of the original understandings, 1914, of what the commission uh, uh, was intended to do. Uh, we, we heard earlier about the, the compromise that altered this, um, but uh, uh, investigate and bring uh, problematic conduct to Congress for authority to act. Um, I don't have a good answer for why they don't take that approach because uh, I, I that is, I think, a approach that I would champion if you're going to be bringing cases that way. If you have that authority and you are going to use it, um, that's how you would do it. I agree with you. I think it's problematic authority and problematic uh, for the agency to actually proceed that way. But strategically, it seems right. I think that's a good point regarding 6B studies, um, which are, are a particularly useful and informative tool, um, and other tools they have at their disposal. Sure, as far as you know, going to Congress, I mean, hypothetically, sure, that makes sense, but if the bet is whether or not Congress is actually going to pass legislation, usually it's no, it's not going to happen. Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have a great answer for why the authority hasn't been used more, but I mean, I think there, there may be a couple of reasons. I mean, certainly if there had been a presumptive recourse to part three, particularly on conduct matters, the FTC really could have developed a body of what this section five law of unfair method of competition mean that would have addressed a lot of really complicated kinds of conduct. Um, that, you know, whether it's unilateral refusals to deal or predatory pricing or, um, you know, how we treat sort of, you know, cross network effects on platforms or bundling, all, all these are kinds of things that I think could have, that would have been a very useful thing to do. The, a couple of reasons that there could be concerns about, and, and if really good opinions, then would have been effectively something for courts to review and decide whether or not to give deference uh, to those decisions, because what you're interpreting is what section five means, not section one or not se or section two. And I would really like to have seen that very careful kind of development. Um, I think that a couple of the reasons that we, you know, and, and other than, a, you know, going into court to get injunctions on mergers, maybe that should have been, you know, where the agency did must, much of, its, much of its work. 
We, but when you think about, that takes a long-term kind of planning and thoughtful approach. You know, you have to pick areas of policy that you want to develop, you have to identify the cases, and you have to hope you have the commission that is going to have sufficient consensus to get the opinion out that's going to steer that law in the right place. And that may be something that, within the incentives and time frame of a particular chair or a particular commissioner, um, you know, feels like a very difficult thing to do, but it really takes some very systematic, um, I, I think, thought and planning. And then, of course, you know, there's a tendency, a temptation to say, let's take that out of part three and do it by consent decree or settlement. Because if we come up in front of the wrong judge, we lose it. And it could take a long time to find another case and hope that it winds up in another circuit. But of course, it's not going to, because once you lose in one circuit, the losing party is always going to take it to that circuit. Um, so I think that it, as a matter of legal development, it might have just been viewed as, as risky uh, in many cases. There's a, another aspect um, that uh, we, we can suss out from this. The Department of Justice is an enforcement agency. That, that is what their identity is. Um, the FTC, uh, as a independent agency, uh, uh, governed by the APA and as well as the FTC Act, um, they have quasi uh, legislative and judicial functions. They have a mixed identity. And when it comes down to, when it comes time to execute your strategy for whatever it is that you are trying to do, well, what is it that you're trying to do? Are you trying to win cases? Are you trying to enforce the law? Are you trying to uh, uh, develop new law? Are you trying to push uh, the norms? Different uh, commissioners will have different views on what their personal goals are, what uh, the goals of the agency are. Uh, and of course, you'll have a changing cast of commissioners um, over time. Uh, so you're going to have inheriting priorities or inheriting things that have been queued up pursuant to previous commission's uh, uh, priorities. So figuring out how you actually want to dispose of the cases is uh, a really uh, a much more complicated uh, equilibrium than for a pure enforcement agency or a pure legislative uh, entity. So we've got the three pending, sort of emerging out of that process now, right? At different stages, right? You've got Axon in the Supreme Court, you've got uh, Illumina Grail, and you've got Jewel Altria, sort of with both with ALJ losses, sort of going to the, uh, coming to a commission near you uh, soon. Uh, <laughs> We sit here a year from now. I mean, we'll get the Axon opinion uh, uh, well before that. But we sit here a year from now. We'll do this sort of as a two-parter as we get close to, to wrapping up. Um, we sit here a year from now. What's the state of FTC Part 3 authority with those three all sort of moving along? Um, and let me put as Part 2... And this sort of begs the question of your view of what's, what's at stake in Axon. These are you know, narrower, broader versions of what might, what might happen there. Um, but part two of the question is, if your answer involves a, a sort of shrinking of part three authority, um, we running into why have the FTC questions? If, you know, we've got no, no rulemaking after a year or none, none you know, if they, if they lose that, that authority, um, are we running into the, the sort of oldie but goodie antitrust question? We've got two agencies. Why? One of the traditional answers is, um, and an answer I, I very much believe in, is the FTC has got and was intended to have this special authority to do um, part three. They've either abused it or not used it over the sort of 100-year experiment. Uh, they've got the Section 5 UMC authority. Maybe they'll use it for rulemaking. Maybe a year from now, a court will say, no, you can't. Um, are, we, are we running it? Is that the subject of next year's, year's conferences? Rulemaking's dead. Part three is uh, dying. Should we just sort of kick the uh, antitrust authority into one agency? I won't make you tell us which one. 
I mean, I, I think what's going to come out of the court next on it, I mean, it is going to be relatively narrow. It depends on who writes a concurring opinion in Exxon and what it says, really. Um, I, I think there'll be a lot of you know, conversations surrounding that. It depends on what sorts of cases the agency continues to bring. Um, I mean, if they keep going in the direction they were with you know, the complaint against Walmart, for example, which, I mean, that's not in house, that's in federal court, but um, that sort of creative claim, I don't see this um, ending very well for them in a year from now. Um, but I, I don't think the Axon opinion itself is going to be very broad in scope. So there are a, po a number of possible outcomes in Axon. I'll, uh, mention a, a couple of them in a moment, but I, I think that my bottom line is I don't think it's likely to affect the part three question. So possible uh, outcomes, first uh, the court uh, could say, uh, no, Axon, sorry, you need to, we're not going to uh, uh, alter this uh, uh, statutory framework. There is no right to get uh, your constitutional challenges before uh, this uh, Article III judge uh, uh, prior to exhausting your administrative remedies. Um, that certainly is possible. I think it's very unlikely. Uh, the court narrowest holding could say, yes, there is, remanded down to uh, the district court judge, and in another five years, we'll uh, uh, deal with Humphrey's executor. Uh, the court could uh, be broader, and the, the goal of Axon and uh, uh, several others in similar challenges is to uh, challenge Humphrey's executor and the constitutional structure of the agency. Um, and I uh, agree with the discussion earlier today. Uh, I don't think that Humphrey's executor uh, is nearly as magical or has the weight that we tend to give it. I don't think that we would mm. substantively see much change. Um, the another possible outcome from Axon, and this is where I think the most interesting possible uh, uh, set of developments would be, um, is uh, you do have the authority to uh, challenge not just the structure of the agency, but raise any constitutional challenges uh, to uh, uh, the agency's underlying theory and case in which case we are going to see a whole lot of folks uh, raising major questions doctrine uh, 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 issues before district judges. Um, and that has the potential, I think, to uh, be the most disruptive and would go potentially to limiting the overall scope of the agency's authority. Um, and yeah, the, the age old, the, the antitrust chestnut of um, one agency or two I, I think that that is a question that has been and is going to continue to be on the table. Um, uh, if, you, if the uh, commission isn't acting uh, as a norm entrepreneur or a research, uh, a de facto research arm of the antitrust establishment uh, and is really just an enforcement agency, it uh, doesn't make that much sense to have two. And now, of course, the, the real challenge, I, I do think that um, uh, on my, I started my career DOJ side of things. Um, I, I actually do think the commission is a better body for uh, antitrust enforcement. The challenge, of course, is the criminal side of antitrust uh, uh, is going to have to stay with uh, the DOJ, which means that you have uh, two separate agencies or you need to have some curious uh, interagency coordination uh, to address that. We are close to out of time. Let me give each of you a chance to uh, offer up uh, any closing remarks you would like or, or observations that you haven't uh, been able to get to and then we'll maybe do, do one or two questions and um, run to the reception. I'll just uh, say Bill is much more eloquent than I am, so you should listen to what he said. And Howard is more eloquent than I am. I don't agree with him on everything that he said, but I'll, I'll nonetheless say you should listen to everything that he said. I'm just here. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. <laughs> uh, we can do a question. Anybody got a qu have a question? We've got in the back. Uh, this is a question for uh, Professor Shalansky. Um, in the debate over whether the 
Democratic majority on the, on the commission is, are activists or fire-breathing activists. You, uh, <laughs> you picked the, the former uh, because they haven't really pushed the envelopes of the law much. Um, but do you feel the same way with regard to rulemaking authority, that they're, they're not fire-breathing because they're not really pushing the law, the, uh, law much? Well, and I, I don't mean a sp the specifics of the rule, but as to having rulemaking authority. Yeah. So I certainly don't mean to call into question the passion of the activism at the agency. <laughs> I want to make that very clear. And just um, sort of the difference between the rhetoric and what's happening on the ground. Um, I think the jury's out. I think we have to wait and see what they do. Uh, I do think that they are taking a very confident view of their authority. Um, that, you know, in light of recent developments at the Supreme Court, West Virginia against EPA, but even really uh, a lot of the developments of the past decade uh, in administrative law is, I think, a somewhat heroic view. But if they don't take that view, why even bother with the rulemaking? So again, uh, I think what they're doing is taking a strong view of their authority, but I, I predict we will see a careful and cautious um, and, and uh, more, uh, more of a steady approach and, and not something you know, crazy or, or really too bold when we see the first rulemaking, which, which I think is the right way to go. All right, so passionate, confident, but not fire breathing. So. <laughs> I'll, I'll also just I'll echo that point about, uh, I, I agree 100%, uh, where the first rulemaking, UNC rulemaking that we see, I expect is going to be narrower and on right. a particular, particularly sympathetic topic. Um, I, I think that that is absolutely right, um, uh, and strategically, it is the, the right thing to do. Um, and I don't know if it's a cooler heads prevailing. I don't know if it's a, a, a solid strategy. I don't know if it's truly reflective of the uh, scope of their ambitions, but th that's correct. I reserve the right to, qu oh, um, you first. Oh, I, I was just going to say that I agree we'll see something more sensible first. It's also easier, it's just easier to write a rule um, of that yes. sort. Yes. Reserve the right now to uh, ask the fire breathing question after the first Robinson Patman enforcement uh, case that comes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, just to comment on that's actually going to be really interesting. Um, and if you read Commissioner Bodoya's speech on the Robinson Patman Act, it sort of calls up the whole, you know, he's not, he, he's a very smart, terrific guy. Um, but not an antitrust person. And so he, I don't know how much depth um, uh, 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 Alvaro has in the history of Robinson Patman and why the doctrine has evolved as it has, but um, when you read his speech, it certainly is a, something of a throwback. And it's gonna be you know, very interesting to see where they go with Robinson Patman and how they negotiate some of the clear problems they're going to run into when they realize that in some cases this is going to mean raising prices to huge numbers of consumers. So that's going to be a, an interesting test of the fire. I'll just add to that. Um, we've been talking about norm setting and pushing boundaries, uh, changing antitrust law, uh, updating and modifying it, however you want to think about this. Um, there's a, a real puzzle with this if uh, how whatever new rules are being developed aren't being reduced to rules, but you proceed through part three uh, litigation, mm -hmm. which is you're not getting the body of common law. Yes. You're ending up with all of these old Supreme Court cases and interpretations of old statutes and zombie statutes that are still out there that we've never done away with because the, the law on the ground has moved on. So then you can have people come in and say, well, there's, there's this really old statute that hasn't been enforced in 40 years, but it's still good law, let's use it. And that creates a lot of uncertainty um, for uh, uh, industry, it creates a lot of challenges and uncertainty for lawyers, and it creates real puzzles for uh, uh, lower court judges who their hands are tied by the law as it exists, not the law that's been developed uh, internally by an agency that hasn't been reduced to rules. Right, and that's also why the bipartisan um, antitrust modernization um, commission did um, recommend the repeal of Robinson Patman. Um, and unfortunately, I, mean, I guess this is wishful thinking that we can just repeal laws that are bad laws and not just kind of shelve them and hope that someone doesn't um, take it and run with it four decades later. But that seems to be the case here. Tad, you have the the rights to the last question of the day.
salt on vertical. And we've had, uh, I guess, NVIDIA Arm, we threw them out. We've had Lockheed Martin, Aerodyne, Aero Aero, yep, Aero Rocketdyne. We've got, and now we've got, I think Illumina Grail is really the most puzzling because here you have a little startup that was started up by the acquirer. It's like we've assigned you to go see if you can come up with a, with a, a test for, for early cancer detection. Okay, you know, the, here they come running back saying, okay, we did it. Now what do we do? Do we do an IPO or would you like to buy us again? And, and the commission, it, it, it's, it's sort of remarkable. Uh, the, sort of the vertical assault in general is remarkable. But what really bothers me about Illumina Grail in particular is how do you how do you say that the, that the complaint is not really a per se rule in the first instance? Yeah. And particularly where the factual context would would, would you know contradict that approach better than almost any vertical case I can handle. I mean, look, I mean, Illumina Grail, and again, I don't know all the facts, and you know, certainly the European Commission has come out differently, so you know, there may be facts that are more compelling that I'm, that I'm unaware of, but, but I would just say this. It, it does look on the surface like it was a, a risky case to bring because you're, you're trying to do two things. You're trying to push back on vertical, where there's, there are more plausible efficiencies, I'll put it that way, and you're dealing with this almost sort of nascent technology that itself had some competitors, um, you know, th 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 in unrelated technologies for multi uh, multi cancer detection. So, uh, so it seemed like they were biting off a lot there. Um, and it seemed risky, but I would just say this about vertical: the icon that they're smashing there is the presumption of efficiencies from reduction of double marginalization. And I think the argument that they would make is this has been too readily and reflexively presumed to allow vertical mergers through. We need to push back on that because there have been vertical harms that have been undetected. Clearly, we're missing something by focusing on that efficiency. And so they're going to overshoot the mark on some cases because, you know, it's true there's a lot less reduction of, you know, elimination of multiple margins than has been presumed. But there still is sometimes elimination, maybe even often, of multiple margins, so that you know you can overshoot in pushing back. And so I, I understand the instinct to look more carefully at vertical. They just haven't found the ana full analytical picture that I think fills in and replaces what was there before. I, I don't necessarily begrudge them for trying to be more aggressive there, but agree with you that you want to pick those cases carefully, so you don't come up with a per se rule against vertical deals. <laughs> And with that, a um, couple of things really quickly. Uh, thank you all of the uh, CSAS and GAI folks who have helped all day, uh, to Jen and uh, Mascot and Adam White, uh, and to all of our speakers. And please uh, join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.